Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It is Dr. Kaz, and I am welcoming you to one of my review sessions for my Anatomy and Physiology 1 class. So let's get started. We'll get right into it. Uh, if you're new to the channel, welcome. If uh, you've been here for a little bit, welcome back. So we're going to talk about some of the basics and some of the really important concepts as you move through anatomy and physiology one and anatomy and physiology two. So let's start off and actually describe or define um, what anatomy is. As you notice here, anatomy is the study of form and structure. So when we're looking at the actual substance of something or its appearance, we are studying its anatomy. And we'll talk about the different uh, fields of anatomy. But for right now, you want to specifically focus on what's underlined in anatomy is form and structure. Whereas part of this class is also going to be studying physiology. And that's the how. That's how the body functions. That's how certain structures, cells, tissues, organs are going to actually do what they do. So we call that the, the function. So anything that is functional is related to physiology. Anything that's really structural is related to anatomy. And the, in, the really important fact of this whole thing, when we're talking about our uh, anatomy and physiology. So like I was saying, um, the important, one of the big concepts that I want you folks to understand about anatomy and physiology is that they are what we refer to as interrelated. And so that's a very important concept because you really can't have one without the other. And you're going to find out as you move through this course that a lot of the physiology that we discuss, which can usually give people more trouble than actual anatomy, is really based off of, the physiology is really based off of the anatomy. We'll see that for certain functions of certain cells, especially when you start talking about histology here. So it used to be when we taught anatomy and physiology, you'd learn an anatomy, uh, a course first, and then you know, like a semester or a year later, you would take a physiology class. So we've kind of done away with that. We're kind of uh, teaching them side by side or actually together. And it makes the understanding um, that much easier, but all and you can actually understand it a little bit better. So let's discuss one of the earlier concepts here of, uh, of anatomy and physiology. And it's called the scientific method. Many of you may have heard of this. Many of may, some of you may have not, but it's actually a system and which scientists use to evaluate study things. And it starts off, all right, there's several steps to it, but it always starts off through observation. Just for example, like Sir Isaac Newton there, when he was sitting under an apple tree and an apple hit him on the head, you know, he observed that. Granted, he felt that too when the apple hit him on the head, but the point being is a lot of times when scientists are going to be um hypothesizing or evaluating something, they start off with observation. And then through the observation, they come up with an idea or what we call a hypothesis. And the hypothesis is their theory, not so much a theory, but their best guess as to why something happens. Try to, this helps to explain whatever phenomenon that they might be observing them. So in order to prove this hypothesis, like the the what we found out to be the law of gravity, Sir Isaac Newton felt like, all right, something was acting on this apple to pull it down towards the earth. So he set up a series of experiments. And that's what we do as scientists, all right? We'll set up a series of experiments to test the hypothesis. And through these experiments, we will collect data. And so as we analyze the data, then we can see if this data is going to support the hypothesis, which is good, or if it doesn't support the hypothesis, which is not necessarily a bad thing, all right, because sometimes you have to fail before you can succeed. And so what will happen is uh, we'll, the scientists will go back to the proverbial drawing board here. And so through that um, experimentation and that data collection, two things can happen. We can either accept the hypothesis or we can reject the hypothesis. If we reject it, we can further modify it and then do the other studying uh, uh, aspects, which we can reevaluate, set up more experiments and collect more data to see if that supports our new hypothesis. So we use the 
scientific method uh, quite often. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. All right, but let's get back into some of the different types of anatomy here. So we're going to start off talking about the microscopic anatomy. And microscopic anatomy is a, a, a type of anatomy or field of anatomy in which we are able to study structures, items that we cannot see, all right, with our eyes, all right, or what we call the unaided eye. So you'll need some sort of microscope, and there's different types of microscopes. We've got electron microscopes, light mic microscopes. They have now these 3D microscopes, things that are very, very helpful in studying right, a lot of the biology that's related to human anatomy here. And so there's two divisions that make up microscopic anatomy. There is the study of body cells, which we call cytology. And then there's the study of tissues, which we call histology. And we'll touch on these, uh, these two divisions uh, throughout my course here. So just something to consider, microscopic anatomy has those two divisions, cytology and histology. So you can see here with the microscopic anatomy at the bottom of the page here, there's a couple slides that we can actually use a microscope to see structures that we would not normally be able to see here. And this too will help us further our understanding of anatomy and therefore help our understanding of physiology. Another form uh, our, our division of anatomy is called gross anatomy, also known as macroscopic anatomy. And this is the, the anatomy that we can see. We'll see structures that are visible all right, to our unaided eye here. So there's several different divisions here. And so as we go through this course, we'll touch on some of these divisions here. So the first one listed there is systemic anatomy, right? And the systemic anatomy is going through each system in the body, like the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, the immune system, All right? So that division of anatomy is based on the systems. Regional anatomy, right? As we move through this course, we'll learn the different body regions here. But regional anatomy, right, is where we're going to be studying structures, right, in different body regions. For example, right, we have our skeletal anatomy in this course. We talk about the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. Those are different regions of the body, right? And so that is an example of regional anatomy. Surface anatomy, right, we'll be focusing on the, what we refer to as the superficial anatomic markings, things that you can see on the surface, mainly on the skin. For example, the umbilicus, that's your belly button, right? That is an item or a structure, right, that is part of superficial anatomy, right? We can use that to determine the location of other structures that might be internal. Same thing with the xiphoid process, which is the bottom portion of your sternum. Also the nipples there, believe it or not, other than, you know, actual superficial surface markings there, they help us to relate to other internal uh, structures there. So surface anatomy is very, very helpful, right, when we need to learn the relation of certain internal body structures. Comparative anatomy, if you've ever dissected a cat or a fetal pig or a frog, right, um, this type of anatomy, we're going to dissect structures, mainly more so with cats and uh, fetal pigs that are very similar to our species, right? It makes it a little bit easier. It's a lot more uh, uh, um, economically sounded, a little bit cheaper to dissect a cat than it is for a human cadaver there. And then one of my favorites at the time, it wasn't my favorite when I was learning it, but embryology. Um, embryology is the actual study of all the changes that occur from the moment of conception to birth. And you would be surprised all of these developmental changes that occur all right, the hundreds and thousands of processes that occur during that nine months when we are developing uh, and growing inside of our mommies right, that uh, brings us to the actual end result of a baby at the time of birth there. All right, so, of course, we can't just you know, cover all the normal anatomy, there's going to be another branch of anatomy called pathologic anatomy, in which now most of this course that you'll be uh, going through, you'll be learning about how things are supposed to function in, in normal settings. Well, of course, 
pathologic anatomy studies anatomy in abnormal settings when there's some sort of change in the anatomy, usually as a result of some sort of disease or condition. Then one of my favorites, radiographic anatomy, this is when we are going to be using imaging to see internal structures. For example, we can use an X-ray machine, all right, we can use an MRI machine, all right, ultrasound, all various types of, of, of equipment and, and internal imaging structures that will help us to study internal structures there. And finally, this um, statement here at the bottom, I cannot stress this enough. Anatomy is dynamic changing science, which is absolutely true. This is something that is ongoing. You would figure by now that we, we would have learned all of the structures that are in the human body. But of course, technology has helped us make leaps and bounds with that. And it wasn't too long ago when we had the 3D microscope in which we were able to see all right, some immune structures in the cells that we didn't know were quite there all right, because we were only using two-dimensional uh, microscopes. But the three-dimensional microscope has actually changed that. Um, there was a dentist back in, 19, I believe, 1996 that discovered some muscles in the neck. Uh, that we didn't know were there before. So some of you might be thinking, well, it took us that long to figure it out. Sometimes we get it right away, sometimes we don't. So this picture that you're seeing here is an example of pathologic anatomy. You can see on the left side of the screen, a healthy liver. On the right side of the screen, what happens to that liver um, when it is damaged through chronic alcohol use, for example, and that's called cirrhosis of the liver. It becomes very scarred, right? Liver is a very... Uh, tough organ, I would say, because you can damage certain parts of it and it can regenerate. But unfortunately, with cirrhosis, the liver is not able to regenerate um, the healthy tissue, all right, from the scar tissue that is left behind there. All right, so let's switch topics here and talk a little bit about physiology. Remember, physiology is going to be function. Function and physiology, relatively the same thing. How all right, certain structures, how the body, how certain systems do what they do, right? So physiologists are going to be looking at the how-to, right, for these body structures, for these organs, for these tissues and whatnot. And so some of the subdisciplines that we see for physiology, you'll see cardiovascular physiology, yeah. neurophysiology, respiratory physiology, the list goes on and on. And so these subdisciplines will pretty much go through, right, certain organ systems, Several of these organ systems you'll cover in anatomy and physiology one, and then several of the remaining organ systems uh, you'll cover in anatomy and physiology two, right? But usually these systems will include several different functions and how they work. And so you'll kind of go through those, like cardiovascular physiology is going to include pretty much everything uh, that's involved in the circulatory system and all right, the structure that moves things through the circulatory system, what we call the heart. And what is it moving through the circulatory system? Blood, all right? Neurophysiology is gonna have to deal with the nervous system. So we're gonna include nerves, the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, respiratory physiology, same thing. Anything that has to do with respiration, mainly the lungs, but you'll learn about how respiratory gases are going to be transported throughout your blood and move from the lungs into the blood and then from the blood into the tissues. Reproductive physiology, all right, we'll talk quite a bit about um, the reproductive cycle, both male and female organs, primary organs uh, that are involved in reproduction and also the reproductive hormones. And of course, a lot of what we talk about will be about normal physiology, but then there's also the abnormal physiology, which is called pathophysiology. So again, pathophysiology has to do with some sort of condition or disease or even injury right, to our system that causes it not to function normally there. So like I said before, all right, very important concept. I want to revisit it. Anatomy right, which is going to be form and structure, and physiology, which is going to be function, the how-to are interrelated, right, and so it's very important that we now teach this, all right, together, right, so you have a better understanding, right, and so you can go out and use this in whatever field that you're going to be entering into, and this will help you to have a better understanding here. So, 
a big thing that we discuss here is form follows function, right? And so I told you that a lot of physiology you'll see, right, when we're learning specifically, I like to use the example of absorption in the digestive tract. You'll see that a lot of the lining of your small intestine is going to be um, lined by what we call simple epithelium, which usually means it's just one cell layer thick, specifically simple cuboidal epithelium. And it's a specific cell, right, that is found to line right, a good portion of your digestive tract. But the reason why you have one cell layer thickness there is so you can get absorption materials. We'll get into more detail about that. The example that you see here on the screen here talks about the alveoli. Those are the air sacs of the lungs. And that's where gas, right, the respiratory gases, oxygen, carbon dioxide, are going to move from the air in your lungs into your blood, and then from your blood, all right, back into the air in your lungs. And so it's really important, right, that the anatomy here, because there's going to be an exchange of gases here, is going to be comparable or facilitates that function, meaning that that anatomy is appropriately suited right for the function of whatever tissue whatever cell whatever organ we're dealing with here so we can actually have proper functioning for gas exchange again more detail on that as we move through the course here All right so just kind of keep that in mind that a lot of this is going to be when we talk about these subjects here a lot of this is going to be interrelated which is quite important So if you look here on this screen here, you will see this gentleman. Uh, he is looking uh, quite happily at this cheeseburger or hamburger. And this picture is basically showing you that process of him eating, what that hamburger is going to basically kind of experience right, as it's moving through the digestive tract, what's going to happen. And again, uh, this course will help you to understand everything that's involved in that simple uh, physiological act of just eating something, drinking something, right? So as we move through the course, you're going to see all these important characteristics and functions and how they're integrated with one another and how they play out. So you can see here that we're talking about the characteristics that describe living things. Give me one second. I'm trying to fix my screen. All right. Stop doing this. There we go. Okay. So some of the characteristics that describe living things, property, properties common to all organisms. So first of all, all since we're going to be focusing on the human body, but one of the things you have to understand is, and if you've taken other biology courses, that all organisms have some sort of organization to them, right? They will exhibit some sort of structure and order. As we go through this course, you will learn a lot about this structure and order there. Right? Of course, just like you and I, right, all living things are going to have a metabolism, which is basically what I tell folks what a metabolism is, is it's just chemical reactions within the body. That's, I mean, if you really want something as basic of a definition for metabolism as possible, just think chemical reactions. But this is all of the chemical reactions in your body. And so there's two types of metabolism. You have anabolism, in which you take small items, small molecules, and you put them together to form larger ones. Anabolic steroids, for example, will help to build up muscle tissue, skeletal muscle tissue. All right. The other type of metabolism is catabolism. And that's where you'll have large molecules that are going to uh, be broken down into smaller ones. Example is going to be, that is going to be um, when you eat something, right? You start to digest it, you start to break it down. And so basically, all right, when when your our metabolism is going to contribute or is actually going to contain one of those items there, it's either going to be anabolism or catabolism. All organisms are going to undergo growth and development, all right, from 
start to finish of their existence here. And basically, all right, they're going to, when they undergo this growth and development, they need to, in order to grow, take materials from the external environment, all right, and eat them, breathe it in, all right, ingest it, whatever you want to call it. They have to take these materials from the outside of the environment, assimil assimilate them, and then they use that material through metabolic processes, for example, to grow and further to develop there. All right, next is going to be, all right, responsiveness. So responsiveness has the ability, uh, is, is the uh, organism's ability to sense a stimuli. Now a stimuli is a change either in the internal or external environment. For example, change in the temperature, right? That's a stimulus. And so responsiveness is the ability that that organism has or possesses to sense what that change is, and then it reacts to it. If it's a painful stimuli, like if you're touching a hot stove, normally you would pull your hand away. And that is your reaction to that painful stimulus. Regulation, right? That has to do with the organism's ability to adjust to the internal bodily function, all right? for whatever type of environmental changes that are occurring. Whether again, those environmental changes are external to that organism or internal to that organism. And which brings us to a very important concept, homeostasis. Now I'll, I'll touch on this in a little bit here, right? But it's important that you understand what homeostasis is. Homeostasis is the ability to maintain body structure and function. So if we were to strike out structure, we could replace that with anatomy. And if we were to strike out function, we could replace that with physiology. So basically, you could say homeostasis is the ability to maintain body anatomy and body physiology. So it's a crucial concept to understand. We'll get more into it, all right, in this chapter here. But next is reproduction. And reproduction is going to be, all right, the organism's ability to produce new cells for growth or new cells to maintain it, certain structures as they kind of age out maybe or repair if they're damaged. So we'll see with our sex cells, what are known as our gametes, all right, when we're dealing with reproduction, that is the creation or the development of new organisms, Right, so reproduction isn't just in creating new organisms, all right, when it pertains to cells, all right, it could be for normal growth, like when we're growing uh, during our childhood, all right, or just maintenance, you know, normal wear and tear, we got to replace things that have worn out, and then of course repair, maybe we damage something, and so, all right, maybe got a scrape on our knee or something, and so we repair that tissue that's been damaged there. So, you can see here on this slide when we talk about that organization, the levels of organi organization for um, biological organisms, um, we go from a simple level to a more complex level. And that's basically what this course is going to kind of go through. We're going to start here at the top of the list and we're going to work our way down. All right, so we're going to start at the chemical level. We talk about atoms and molecules and macromolecules and the really small items. Then we'll graduate on to the cellular level, talk about the, the basic unit, all right, that is in all of us, right, which are called cells. And then when we move on to the tissue level, we're just going to take a whole bunch of cells that are similar to one another that have a common function, whether it's protection or that function is absorption or that function is secretion, right? We'll move on to that tissue level. After that, we move on to the organ level when we take several tissues, all right, and these tissues, they, they, they'll be different types of tissues, and they start to work together, right? Like, for example, the stomach. Right? The stomach has four, all four tissue types in it. It has nervous tissue, it has muscle tissue, it has connective tissue, and it has epithelial tissue. And so these multiple tissues, all right, are brought together, and they start to uh um, work together for whatever that purpose is, for the stomach, for digestion, for example. And then we have our organ system level. So we're going to take several organs that are worked together. And again, we'll see all of that when we move through the different systems of the body. Right? And then eventually we'll add up all of those organ systems, 
put them together. And that's when we, we reach our most complex level of organization, which is the organismal level. So let's get back to homeostasis. Homeostasis is a crucial concept. So I'll take my time on this, but it's very important that you develop a good understanding of this. And you can see the top of the screen here, homeostasis, keeping internal conditions stable. That's important. We have to keep our internal environment, the, the conditions that are inside of our bodies, stable here. So I'll read off the definition of homeostasis, the ability of an organism to maintain consistent internal environment in response to changing internal or external conditions. It's a lot. It's kind of a lot to take in. But basically, homeostasis is going to be, how does our body respond when certain things that are occurring either inside of us or outside of us are changing? A stimulus, for example. And how does our body respond to that? And does it respond to it in the correct fashion to maintain all right, a consistent internal environment because we want everything running well, right? For example, our body temperature, right? 98.6 is the set point. That's the, 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 the temperature that is considered to be normal, but we have a range that's involved with that, right? 96.4 is the low end of that range and then 99.1 degrees is going to be the high end of that range. But anything in that range is usually considered to be a normal body temperature. But there's things that happen to us all the time that can affect our internal body temperature. And we'll discuss that all right, throughout anatomy and physiology here. But basically, how does our body respond to that? How does our body respond to when we start to exercise and our tissues demand more oxygen, right? So they can undergo metabolism Right, so they can the cells and those tissues can supply energy. Right, how does our body respond to that? Well, usually your heart pumps faster. Why? Right, because we got to give more blood to those tissues because they demand more oxygen that's in that blood. So you'll learn about all that fun and exciting information as this course goes on. So you'll see that there are hundreds, if not thousands, right of different anatomical structures and physiological processes and, 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 and chemical reactions that occur in our body that our body is going to constantly be monitoring to determine right, if homeostasis is indeed happening. Because if homeostasis isn't happening, then we got a problem on our hands. So let's talk about the components of the homeostatic systems here. There's three components that are involved in our homeostatic system. We have our receptor, control center, and effector. Now, as the course goes on, we're gonna to start to extrapolate on this and it becomes a little bit more detailed, but we're gonna start off with the real basic and simple understanding of the three component homeostatic systems here. So the first one is the receptor and it has an easy job. I say easy job, but it really does. Its job is to detect any types of changes that occur in the internal or external environment. Basically, its job is to monitor for stimuli, for a stimulus, which is a change in the internal or external environment there. And so if the temperature in the room that you're sitting in as you're watching this video increases or decreases, right, do the receptors pick that up? And so what happens when they do, right? Well, they will send sensory input information to the control center. And so that control center is usually going to be either the nervous system or the endocrine system. And so that information is going to reach the control center. The control center will then um, interpret that information. And then it's going to kind of evaluate it and determine what type of change needs to occur. So for example, if the room is too cold, what is your body going to do to warm itself up? So the nervous system is great because we can get a quick response from it, right? Whereas the endocrine system, right? It's not gonna be as quick, but its effect will last longer. Nervous system uses electrical uh, signals to communicate to, its, to the, uh, the, the components of its system. Whereas the endocrine system uses chemicals, hormones, for example. And then finally, when the control center is determined what type of change it wants to affect, it sends what we call motor output information out to effectors. 
And the effector is the structure that's going to bring about that change. So if the room is cold and that sensory input information gets to the control center and the control center is like, I got to warm things up. One of the things you might start to do is going to be to shiver. And that shivering will start to warm you up. So our effectors are going to be two things. Okay, they're a structure, but they're either going to be a muscle or they're going to be a gland. Okay, so let's keep it simple. The KISS principle, keep it simple. All right. Muscles and glands, are, are those are going to be our effectors there. So if we want to kind of get in a little bit more of a detailed understanding of the components of the homeostatic systems here, we're going to be looking at what we call a feedback loop. And I'll get into that in a second here. Okay, a feedback loop. So the first thing that you're seeing at the top of that screen there is the stimulus. So in order for any of this to occur, we have to have some sort of stimulus to happen. And then we're gonna need a receptor that's gonna be able to monitor that stimulus. And that's what happens. So stimulus occurs, the receptor detects that stimulus, and then it relays sensory input information to the control center, which is going to be most likely the central nervous system or the endocrine system. So that information goes to the control center. And then of course, the control, system, the control center mulls it over, interprets that information, evaluates it, analyzes it, and then it determines what type of response it would like to have. And then it carries out that response through the effectors, which is going to be a muscle and or a gland. And by having that happen, okay, this will bring us, this will either maintain or help to return us into homeostasis through those effectors. So this screen here is showing you kind of an example here of what we're looking at right, when we're dealing with our, our um, components of the homeostatic, uh, uh, homeostatic control system here. So you have your stimulus. For example, something is too low. If your blood pressure is too low, if your body temperature is too low, Right? So you have receptors that monitor that, and then they uh, send that information, okay? The receptor detects that information or that stimulus, and then it sends that information, what we call sensory input information, to the control center. And the control center then is going to evaluate that information, analyze it, all right? And then it's going to integrate and figure out what type of response that it's going to initiate through the effector. And it sends that information out to the effector. We usually call that motor output information to the effector, which is either a muscle or a gland. And that muscle or gland is going to bring about that change, all right, that resulted from that stimulus. And it brings us back into homeostasis there. And that's, you know, the homeostatic control system in, in a nutshell there. So that brings us to what we call our negative feedback. So again, we're dealing with a, what we call a feedback loop. Right, so you have some sort of stimulus, and then we're going to have a response to that stimulus that's going to bring us back to homeostasis here. So the first one is called a negative feedback. And the negative feedback, a couple important facts about the negative feedback loop there. All right, Most of the processes that occur in your body are going to uh, operate by the negative feedback. And so you can see here, all right, when we're dealing with certain types uh, of processes in the body. For example, let's let's go back to body temperature, okay? Your, your normal body temperature, and I don't know why my thing is doing that, is 98, that's awful, 98.6. All right, so 98.6 is what we refer to as the set point. That's the ideal body temperature. All right, so the low for body temperature is going to be 96.4. And then the high is going to be 99.1. All right, so what? that's the range. So 96.4 to 99.1 is going to be the range. And so our set point is pretty much where we want to kind of float everything around. So that's what we're talking about here, right? Our normal range for body temperature is going to be set around our set point, which is for body temperature 98.6. All 
So what will happen is if our body temperature starts to drop, right, when we're using the negative feedback loop, all right, the result of the effectors is going to be in the opposite direction of the stimulus. So if body temperature drops, our effect or the result of that stimulus is going to be we want to increase our body temperature. And the same thing, if our body temperature gets too high, if we start floating around 100, 101, 102, we want to, as a result of that negative feedback loop, we want to lower that body temperature and get it back into our normal all right, range for body temperature, ideally around our set point, which would be 98.6. So perfect example, let's talk about temperature here. All right, so we have our temperature regulation. So our example would be if the body temperature drops, all right, the receptors, the thermal receptors in your skin are going to monitor that stimuli, and then it's going to send that information to the control center. So it's going, the receptor is going to be stimulated to detect that stimuli of that decreasing body temperature. It sends that information, sensory input information to the control center, specifically to the hypothalamus. That's where our body temperature regulation is found in the brain there, right? And then the hypothalamus is going to evaluate that information. It says, whoa, body temperature is dropping. We need to increase the body temperature. So the hypothalamus is going to send motor output information to the effectors, muscles and or glands. So it's going to send motor output information to the, your, the muscles in your blood vessels, specifically the blood vessels in your skin. And it's going to cause right, the muscles in the blood vessels, okay, to constrict or contract. And what that will do is that will cause the blood vessels in your skin to become smaller. So less blood does not flow through your skin. Now, some of you are thinking, oh, well, that's ridiculous. I'm cold. I should have blood going to my skin. Folks, it's more important that blood goes to your internal organs. So given the choice, your body's going to choose your internal organs every time over the skin. So it's going to decrease the diameter of the blood vessels in your skin, and it's going to move that blood from your skin. Not completely, all right? You just won't have as much. And so it's going to move it, all right, from your skin, all right, to the internal organs there. Now, something you have to understand about blood is that it's one degree warmer than our normal body temperature, which is nice. Okay, because when blood flows into an area, it helps to warm that area. Okay, so obviously, when that blood moves from our skin to our internal organs, it helps to keep them warm. So they can continue operating as, as they're supposed to, right? But that decrease in the amount of blood going to your skin, right, you will see sometimes people's lips will appear blue if they're really, really cold. But at the same time, because like I said, our blood is a degree warmer Right? If we move it away from our skin and keep it closer to the internal part of our body, we'll lose less heat from that blood. So as a result of blood leaving the skin and going to those internal organs, we lose less of it. At the same time, okay, remember the effectors, muscles and glands, we have other muscles in our body, the skeletal muscles, they'll start to shiver. Shivering equals friction, friction equals heat. That also warms us up. And then we also have muscles that attach onto our hair follicles all throughout our body. And it will create what we call goosebumps. Right? And goosebumps are a way of uh, the hair on our body to help trap the heat against our skin there. So you just saw three ways, all right, with temperature regulation that your body is going to help manage your body temperature. So if we look at the, the, the opposite, when our body temperature rises, same scenario in the beginning, okay, we have the thermal uh, receptors in our skin, they monitor that decrease, or excuse me, the increase in body temperature, and that sensory input information gets sent to the same place, to the hypothalamus, that's our control center. 
And then the hypothalamus does what it does. It evaluates the scenario and the situation, and then, it, and then it, it's going to figure out how it wants to respond to that. And so by doing so, it's going to send out that motor output information to the effectors. And so again, we go back to the blood vessels. It's going to affect the smooth muscle in the blood vessels, and it causes the, the smooth muscle in the blood vessels to what we, what we call vasodilate. It relaxes, that causes vasodilation, which increases the inside opening of the, of the blood vessels. We call that the lumen. And so that allows more blood to flow, all right, in those blood vessels in our skin. So when that blood is flowing, all right, in those blood vessels, it's closer to the surface of the skin. And so the heat that the blood carries is able to leave the body, all right, which is a nice way of getting rid of that excess heat there, right? But we also will start to sweat. That involves glands as another effector, right? And so you can kind of see how this is all related. These two pictures here just kind of show you what I was just talking about. And you'll notice going back to that increase in body temperature, right? Some folks, when they're really hot, their face might appear fl uh, flushed, right? Especially in lighter skinned individuals, you can see it quite easily. That's because there's a lot of blood flow gl going there. And so the heat is being is at the surface of the skin. It's easier to leave the body when it's at the surface of the skin. And if you want to make it even easier, if you start to sweat, the evaporation there, all right, of that sweat off of our skin also provides another way to cool the body down. So those are just two of the examples of homeostatic regulation. A couple uh, more that we'll be uh, kind of uh, going through in this course. Uh, we'll talk about the withdrawal reflex in response to an injury. Like, for example, if you touch something that's hot and you pull away, or if you step on something like a Lego, those of you that are parents and you've gotten up in the middle of the night and walked through a room and the kid was and your child or children were in there playing with Legos and you step on it, you know what I'm talking about, All right? Heart rate, blood pressure, right? In accordance to certain activities, exercise being one of them, or if you start to actually... Um, Bleed out, for example, if someone chops your hand off and you start to lose a lot of blood, right? How these changes occur. I mean, there's several different types. What happens, right, to our breathing rate? If you have an increase in carbon dioxide, you'll see an increase in breathing rate because you're trying to breathe out that carbon dioxide and get rid of it. If you have decreased levels of calcium in your blood, all right, certain hormones like the parathyroid hormone gets released, all right, to uh, increase blood calcium levels, all right, decrease blood calcium levels, that's called hypocalcemia. Same type of scenario happens if you have too much calcium in your blood, what we call hypercalcemia, you'll see a release of hormones that will affect that, all right. And then especially when you get into anatomy uh, and physiology too, you'll talk about how insulin is going to be released depending on um, increased levels of, of your blood glucose or what happens when your blood glucose level starts to decrease and what happens to your insulin release there. So again, these are, again, examples of homeostatic regulation, but all of these examples that are listed on this page all have to do with this. These three components, all right, are going to be involved in everything that I just talked about when we're dealing with, right, these examples here. So just kind of keep that in mind because it will make it that much easier for you. Okay, so that was negative feedback. Let's talk about the positive feedback loop because remember our homeostatic systems are going to be controlled by Negative feedback loops or positive feedback loops. Now, the positive feedback loops, we don't see as much as we do the negative feedback loops. So what we'll see in this scenario is a stimulus occurs, but now the outcome, whatever the effector is going to do, it's not going to move in the opposite direction. It's actually going to move in the same direction as that stimulus there. So you can see, all right, some of the examples here, breastfeeding, uh, blood clotting in labor, right? So for example, with labor, right? One of the stimuli that helps with labor is if as long as the, as the baby's head 
is in in the correct position and it's not a breach a position where it's head down as long as it's not a breach position where it's butts down all right but if it's in the correct position where the baby's head is down against the cervix the pressure of that baby's head against the cervix that's the stimulus is going to actually cause labor contractions to continue and increase over time same thing with blood clotting all right as long as you're bleeding you're going to continue the clotting process until it stops same thing with breastfeeding as long as the baby is nursing and suckling on the breast all right that's the stimuli there then mom is still going to be hopefully producing milk and enough of it for the baby there so consider this with positive feedback loops that the stimulus is reinforced and that outcome that the effector brings about is going to be in the same direction there and then eventually whatever happens, like for example, with labor, once the baby is born, all right, the stimulus is gone. And then we go back to homeostasis there. So there's your example for positive feedback. You can see the baby suckling on the breast there. That's the stimulus. You have the tactile receptors there in, in, in the breast around the nipple there that is sending information to the hypothalamus there. That's our control center. The hypothalamus is then going to tell our pituitary gland, the posterior pituitary to release oxytocin. And oxytocin is going to cause the ejection of breast milk. And as long as the baby keeps nursing and suckling on the breast, this process will be in effect there. And that's a great example of positive feedback. All right, so moving on. All right, we talked about homeostasis. We talked about anatomy and physiology and the subdisciplines and the different divisions there. All right, but let's quickly review here some of these concepts here. All right, this is a great slide to basically kind of cover what I just talked about in the past half hour, 45 minutes, however long I've been talking here. All right, one, keep in mind, very important, right, that our homeostatic systems, anatomy and physiology, they're dynamic, they're always changing, right? The control center is either going to be the central nervous, excuse me, the nervous system or the endocrine system. And then when we're dealing with the homeostatic control system there, we have three components, the receptor, the control center, the effector. Most, all right, of these homeostatic control systems are regulated through negative feedback. Most of them, not all of them. And then some are regulated through the positive feedback. If any of these feedback loops, if this system fails, then you are no longer in homeostasis. And as a result of that, you will be in a state of what we call disease. All right, good slide there. It's a good review, something that I hope that you all can walk away from and really understand these concepts on that slide there. So here's just some of those examples for some of those ranges that I was kind of talking about for the homeostatic variables. You have set points and you have ranges there. So you can see body temperature, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. But of course, remember I told you there was a range involved. The high number for that is 99.1 degrees Fahrenheit and the low number was 96.4. And the set point was 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, blood glucose, 80 to 100 milligrams per deciliter. That's kind of where we wanna see blood glucose levels there. Right, on the normal, if it starts to go above that, like 120, 200, your insulin will be going haywire. I mean, what I mean by that is your pancreas will be releasing insulin to help decrease your blood glucose levels to get it back down into this range. If it falls below that, all right, then there's a series of hormones. Glucagon, for example, is an example of one of those hormones that helps to elevate blood glucose levels. Blood pressure. Again, everybody knows that the average value for blood pressure is 120 over 90 okay but there's also a range for that the low range for your blood pressure is 90 over 60 anything below that is considered to be what we call hypotensive and then anything above that all right uh, excuse me not anything above that um the high number of that range is 140 over 90 and anything above that is going to be hypertensive Right. And again, this is all subject to change um, if, uh, if, if uh, the uh, cardiovascular uh, 
um, geez, I'm having a brain fart. If uh, our cardiovascular association decides to change those values, but as of right now, 140 over 90 is the high for blood pressure. And then 90 over 60 is the low end of the normal range there for blood pressure there. And so how do we get these values? Well, of course, through data collection. We just started in what we consider to be healthy individuals, people that did not have disease, uh, relatively fit, right? Did not have a lot of issues. We just collected all this data from these folks, all right? And then we just, from that data, we were able to establish these values there. So most of us, all right, pretty much 95% of us will fall in those ranges there. But there's also a small percentage that fall outside those ranges. And it doesn't mean that they're not healthy okay because they are it's just that their normal is just slightly different i've got a brother-in-law who his body temperature always runs a little bit high and he was constantly being sent home as a little kid from school for having a temperature and his mother would keep telling the school no this is his normal temperature i assure you he's not sick because that means he would be sick 365 days a year right because his normal body temperature ran above the normal values there but he was still considered to be in the healthy population so I've talked about insulin. So let me discuss diabetes here. So what happens when we fall out of homeostasis, when we get into that disease state there, right? So for example, diabetes is when right, an individual has trouble right, maintaining right, that proper blood glucose value there. And a lot of times it could be something might not be functioning, might not necessarily be the pancreas, but it could be the pancreas, it could be the peripheral tissues not responding to insulin. But the point of, uh, of the matter is, all right, that this individual will have problems regulating their blood glucose levels there. And so what we'll see in these individuals, they'll have high blood glucose readings. So of course, then there's a, a, a several ways that we can try to help this individual. One, right, we want to figure out what's going on with this person. So we have to diagnose this person, find out why is their blood glucose level elevated, right? Is it type one diabetes where their pancreas is no longer functioning and they're not producing insulin? Or is it, do they have type two diabetes where they're getting some insulin resistance to some of their peripheral uh, tissues there? So we have to first find out what the diagnosis is before we can really treat this individual. Once we find out the diagnosis, then we can come up with an effective treatment plan to treat this person. And in the case of somebody with diabetes, all right, a lot of times, all it takes is the proper medications, right, to help this person, right? Now, of course, with anything, sometimes with medications, you will get side effects. And we have to be careful of those side effects because those side effects can also cause issues in other homeostatic control systems. So you always have to kind of be aware of that. But in most situations with folks with diabetes, right, once we get the, pro the, the correct medication, then usually their situation is pretty much taken care of there, right? So how do we do this, right? Someone comes to you with a problem, how do we help them with their problem? We're gonna use the scientific method. Doctors do this all the time. Physical therapists do this all the time, all right? Chiropractors do it all the time. Right? You, you have these medical professionals right, that use the scientific method. They might not realize that they're using the scientific method, but they do it, all right? So here's what happens. Patient comes in, they start complaining to you or telling you what their issue is. And so when the doctor or medical healthcare professional is listening to this patient and observing this patient the whole time, the whole time they're collecting data. Whether it's from the intake form that that patient filled out, or through the patient interview when they're sitting there talking to the patient, or whether they start to do uh, take vital signs on this patient, all that is data. And so what do they do? Now, with that information, with the complaint of the patient, and that data that they've collected, they can form their hypothesis. In the medical community, we call that the differential diagnosis, right? They start to come up with their diagnosis for what is wrong with this patient. So then now the real fun begins. They come up with what we call a differential diagnosis, which is a list of possible things that could be bothering this patient, right? 
most likely what they do is they start with the, the most likely diagnosis. And then so they start to order tests. Let's do some blood work. Let's take an MRI or take a CT scan. All right. Let us go through a series of tests all right, that will help us to determine all right, what the issue is by gathering data. And then these tests will either confirm what the hypothesis is. If not, we just scratch that, that diagnosis, that differential diagnosis off our list and move on to the next one that we might think. All right? If it confirms it, great. Now we have our diagnosis and now we can treat the patient. If we have to treat them with drugs, again, like I said, you always have to consider all right, whether or not the drugs or drug is going to be the best course of action there. Because like I said, some drugs can affect other homeostatic control mechanisms that weren't related to the patient's situation there. So for example, you might have a patient that has anxiety or depression, right? And so normally, will uh, prescribe them some SSRIs, right? Class or second generation um, drugs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. These drugs here, okay, they're known for preventing the reuptake of a neurotransmitter called serotonin in the brain. And so what happens is a lot of times people that complain of depression or anxiety, right, will have a decrease in neurotransmitter serotonin release. And so what this drug does is it prevents the reuptake. So it, it elevates right, serotonin levels in our neurons in the brain, and it helps to prolong the effect of that serotonin in the synaptic cleft of the neurons, specifically in the brain, helps to deal with anxiety, helps to deal with depression. Unfortunately, Right? We have to be careful because it can affect the digestive system. So people might come and complain of some digestive related results. Also, you have to be very, very careful right, with younger people, especially kids, because serotonin can affect bone growth. So there's a lot of things that you have to be kind of cognizant of. Again, do, all right, will this drug right, or this treatment, is that going to be the best course of care? Hopefully it will be. And in this picture here, you can see just, I just threw it here at the end, just showing you, all right, some of the medical imaging, all right, that you might use to help when you order some tests, all right, for a patient, all right, for a specific complaint there. Well, folks, that concludes, all right, our, la our um, first chapter here on anatomy and physiology one. I hope you enjoyed it. It was a pleasure talking to you. And folks, have a wonderful day and enjoy everything.